Welcome back, Internet, to Makers on Tap. Tonight, you have me for your host, Joe, and... And Aaron. We are in a very special location tonight. This will be a probably differently paced episode than we've ever had in the past. We're sitting in my backyard, looking at the smoldering remains of what was torn out of my basement last weekend. After a flood. (laughs) Drinking some Dark Lord. 2019 Dark Lord. Oh, yes. It was a gift to us by uh, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. I think you still listen. Thank you. (laughs) Regardless. I've also got my corncob pipe that I haven't touched in a little over a year now. And it's wonderful. It's official. Aaron truly is an old man. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So, we don't have news topics because we don't have computers in front of us. We don't have the internet to look things up on because we don't have computers in front of us. This will be a very different episode. We need to do project updates. We certainly can do project updates. Yes, we can. There's so many. Why don't you go ahead with that? This has been such a crazy, crazy couple weeks. So, not to dwell on it too much, but my my whole workshop got screwed last week. And it's really forced me to take an inventory on past projects that I watched float by me in floodwaters, (laughs) literally. And, uh be able to say that those aren't important anymore. And so all my drone stuff's gone. And that was such a big burden off me to not, not have to move that stuff around and not have to worry about like, who am I going to give this to? Or do I want to try and sell this stuff? Or do I want to get back? No. It takes a decision away from you. Yeah. And that, that was really, really freeing. And also freeing was, uh, um, just like a whole bunch of decisions on projects that have been in the back of my head got made for me that weekend. So that was, was good. The bad was I got a lot of projects foisted on me, like remodeling my basement unwillingly, but that's okay because now I can make that my own and make it serve me well. But one really cool project update that I am really excited to share is I am finally diving into the world of making custom eyewear. This is something that I've been wanting to do for probably four years now. Um, I saw a guy making really amazing laser cut wood glasses at uh, Omnicorp in Detroit a few years ago. He was laser cutting the veneers and then vacuum forming them and impregnating them with epoxy. It was so cool. Uh, he made beautiful stuff and I wish I re- I haven't even been able to find his stuff on the internet since then so that I could like plug him now <laughs> and that makes me sad but I have been designing and 3D printing glasses frames that I will have at East Coast Rep Rep Fest God willing um, and uh, th- they're just they're super cool uh, this episode's going to come out way after Earth, probably. Oh, yeah. Well, who knows? we'll see. I we'll see. Anyway, uh, but right now I'm playing with soluble supports for all the supports in the glasses frames, PLA for the frames, and uh, filamentum flex fill 98A TPU for the hinges. And they're all printed in a single piece on the tool changer and um, I'm really excited about them. I found a friend that works in a lens lab that's going to help me make lenses for them and I'm excited to see where this can go. So we're not, we're, there's no webcam between us. It's weird. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little creepy. Look at me dead in the eye smoking a pipe. <laughs> the camera really does add 10 pounds. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> No, nah, that's all the sleeplessness burning it off. 
Well, I've actually been doing a lot this past uh, week and a half with uh, stuff for the makerspace. And that's part of what had me come up with the, the idea for the topic for tonight. But I have been working very hard on an automated way to reduce the amount of work needed for our members, for our volunteers at the makerspace. We're starting to get a lot more members coming into the space now, which is great. Yeah, huge influx. Yeah, but and with that, all the small manual stuff now gets, you know, multiplied. Yes. And our number of volunteers hasn't grown with the number with the, the influx of people. Nope. So now I'm trying to come up with ways to, you know. You know, I wouldn't say that because the new members that we've gotten have been super active in the space and they have been volunteering to get areas that have been neglected running um, in ways that we haven't seen in the past. So I wouldn't yeah. say that the volunteer hasn't grown. It just hasn't grown in the areas that you're specifically focused in. Yeah, that, that, that's an accurate assumption. Uh, that's an accurate, <laughs> yes. So what I'm specifically focusing on is dealing with the new member onboarding. Because currently it's entirely manual where a new user will sign up on our site. We get an email saying a new, a new user has registered. Then it's a second step on their end to then actually follow through with a subscription with the membership. So we have to wait for two emails. We have to wait for the registration and then successful subscription email. Once we see both of those, then we send them a, an invite to our Slack workspace. And that's again, a manual step. Then once they join, we, I generally will set like a 30 day Slack reminder to then add them to our, our new door access channel to get, to get the door code. All of that is manual. All of it is dependent on one of us seeing those emails come through. Yeah. And I don't know if you, you actually, you didn't see this, Joe. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to jump back and forth a bit. So I'm writing, I'm writing this, this, um, I'm, I'm creating this serverless, um, Python based architecture so that we can use an automated, automated scripts run in the cloud to automate all these tasks. One of those being the, the new invite onboarding process. And while I was writing the scripts this week, um, I found two members that had signed up in August that we never sent Slack invites to. What? Yes. They've, they've been paying their memberships for two months. <laughs> they, didn't, they, they, they didn't reach out to us. We never sent are anything they, to them. Are they coming into the space? No. So one's a digital member, and I think the other's just a full member. He's a digital member paying for slack only yeah <laughs> yes yeah so, all right so so I, the I, holes are showing <laughs> exactly so this is the first time that we really like missed something and so i like i you know i actually wrote a very lengthy you know personal message to both of them saying you know, how sorry i am that they, they fell through the cracks and i sent them the slack invites and said that i'm actively working on new processes to, to so this wouldn't happen again yeah but you know, that really proved my point at that, you know, in writing this. So I'm working on that. So I've talked to some people about this already, but that is for those, for those who know much about cloud technologies, this is going to be a Python based AWS Lambda based, uh, daily job runner type thing. I feel like you just said a bunch of words. Oh, I totally did. <laughs> so these are all just Python scripts. And they're going to be bundled up into AWS Lambda functions, which are, um, it's a serverless computing type thing. So we, instead of, you know, having a server running 24 seven and paying for that, you only pay for the seconds that your script runs. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. So that way, and, and, and each AWS account is a million free Lambda seconds. So my goal is to <laughs> keep the jobs small and keep the number of times they run small to maximize that free tier. Okay. So that's why I'm kind of shooting for just a bunch of daily jobs that just run in succession. Um, but that, that's what I'm currently working on. Um, I also made a lot of progress on um, virtualized training. Mm -hmm. I, I actually made a whole dedicated Slack channel where I had people chiming in on how they thought the best approach would be. We, Boy, that channel got crazy. It did. We had a lot of good discussion. Yeah. And we bounced around a lot. The initial idea was a WordPress server with some um, learning management system plugin on top. Then after some discussion, we realized we already have 
a uh, a wiki hosted on Gitbook that we can embed YouTube videos on, and then we can embed Google Forms on for like quizzes and stuff. So then we thought we can just shoehorn it into the the wiki, so that wouldn't cost us anything. It's already something we have in place, right? But what? But the part that made me think about this topic was we have as a nonprofit we have Google G Suite for nonprofits. Um. Not only does that give each member, you know, 30 gigs of drive storage and uh, a domain, a account domain under Derivative Labs out space domain, but it gives us access to Google Classroom, oh. which is made for online classes and online learning. Yeah. So one thing I'm going to I'm gonna try and do in the next couple of weeks is throw up like a prototype training class. I might even do the videos myself. It may just be like general 3D printing guidelines and stuff, just what I can find on YouTube. Then come up with a basic quiz, like test your knowledge, make sure you actually learn something. Yeah. See how that see how that resonates with the membership because if we can do that, because training is like one of the biggest pain points and in, in, for new people. Yes. And a big pain point for volunteers who actually have to give the training. I feel like I'm talking a lot, but I've no. been, I've been doing a bunch. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that that that's a. Uh, I kind of put the uh, the printer bought simple build on pause for Earth. I it's my first printer that I've been building from scratch, and with the 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 you know the deadline to get our stuff for to Earth coming up. Yes, it was getting awfully stressful, and I understand. I, I don't like I don't like being stressed out when I'm trying to learn things. Yeah, if it was something that I knew how to do, then that's different. But I'm learning this all as I go. It's the first printer I've been building without instructions. And I've been enjoying the learning process so far, and I I kind of want to preserve that fun. Yeah. Yeah, I ended up putting my printer build for Earth on hold, too, after everything. So that's why I refocused on the tool changer glasses for Earth. Um, a little lower bar, still fun, and I think different. I've never seen somebody do this before, so I'm really excited to bring it to Earth. And yeah, after having a pair of glasses for two years that everybody thought was 3D printed, I'm very excited to finally have a pair of glasses that will be 3D printed. Yeah, it's funny. But it the the serverless function brings up a, an interesting point too that um, the flood has really changed my mindset on a whole bunch of things. And one of them was my uh, file server that I've always been super proud of and uh, pushed people towards, which is having a next cloud server at my house. And, you know, it's cool. I, I love having a three terabyte server that's at my house. I love knowing that my data is where it is. You know, all of that data is in my basement but the problem is all of that data is in my basement <laughs> and both places. It was backed up in two places and both places. One of them got water and almost got destroyed. It survived. And the other one was like two inches away from being completely submerged. So, which is a one U server. It doesn't take a lot to fully submerge a one U server. But the point is that very quickly, I could have lost three terabytes of project history so you know the rule, right? What? It's it's three three. You have to have data in three locations, two on site and one off site. See, that's the one I'm missing is the yes. off site one. And um, so now I'm looking for the off site solution, and I feel like I'm going to end up selling out to the man somewhere to get it because I just want it to be easy. Oh, I already did. It's been fun having my data maintained by me for the last couple of years, and. I think it's a good feather in my cap, but um, I'm over it. I, I just want my server to work every yeah. time I know. I feel like the past year we've been doing this podcast, you you could probably see a clear trend of me devolving from, <laughs> from my, <laughs> my self-hosted open source ways to, I just want it to work. Here's some money. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that was today where I also my my own I also had a next cloud instance, but it was it was it was a cloud virtual machine. So like I off sourced some of the hardware stuff, you know. But I had it running in a snap, which snap packages auto update. And I also had it uh what else? Essentially it was all auto updating. And so this this past week it just shit itself. It updated 
and then something broke. Now I can't access it. <laughs> and my wife is freaking out because all of her photos are up there. And I just today I'm like, you know what? You know, screw it. I'm just going to get you know, a two terabyte Google Drive plan because I don't, my time has become so limited since having a kid. Mm-hmm. I don't want to keep spending it fixing these self hosted things. Yeah. Like it's great. It was great when I had the time and the energy. But now it's like I'd rather just pay the money and have it work so I can work on things I actually care about, you know? Well, and, you know, it, they were fun when we were building them. I learned so oh, much yeah, building sure. that server and, you know, building a, a self hosted web server and doing all those stuff, like things that I really wanted to know. But I don't care anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing that I recently found out is that. It doesn't matter if Nextcloud is your server is on the same LAN, it still syncs through the web client, so it like goes out uh-huh. and back. So I'm still limited by my slow rural internet. Yeah, I was a uh, for my own in in my own LAN, and that's not okay. <laughs> yeah, that's that's so awkward. <laughs> I was I was actually talking to Sam, one of our members, last week at the space because we were talking about ripping out all of our rack servers that barely get used and replacing them all replace them all with pies. And Sam was talking to me about all this, you know, locally hosted things. I'm like, yeah, but we could just, you know, pay to do it in the cloud and just not have to dick with it. Yeah. Cause like we only have like a couple people who are experienced with managing servers and technology and stuff. He's like, but Aaron, you're the one that got me into all this, you know, <laughs> open source self hosted things. I'm like, yes, Sam, keep doing it. Cause you've got the time keep <laughs> keep fighting the fight <laughs> yes yeah you know there's still certain things that i want to keep local that i probably won't put on somebody else's computer but for the most part a lot of my stuff can go somewhere i just want to be able to access it all the time and be okay with it so i'll probably end up buying a a uh, a nas that has a good web client for the stuff that i want to keep private and put the rest of it on my two terabyte Google drive that I've been paying for forever and not yeah. utilizing. So in the same vein, I, I built a, a free NAS um, box back in 2016 or 2017. I think it's 2016. And it's got, you know, three, three terabyte drives and uh, whatever the rate, it's like rate five, whatever, where you get like one drive redundancy. Yeah. Um, and that thing's in you know rock solid this entire time, but it's complex as shit to get set up. Yes, and e- I've been using this for almost three or four years now. I still can't get permissions set up correctly, <laughs> and that bugs the shit out of me because like I can't, I can barely get it working in Cody. I, oh god, I've, yeah. got, I've got some some torrent clients, and the permissions for the files you download get all fucked up, and I can't, I can't delete or do anything because I'm not the owner. I'm like, bitch. What? <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's like the transmission client is the owner. Oh, okay. And, and, See, the, and this is the exact reason I built the next cloud yeah. because like that, the permissions were easy to deal with and, you know, getting, I'm going to end up just resetting this up in a better way. I see it now. <laughs> I just want to go to some like a Synology. Yeah. Like I just want an off the shelf solution. I can slap some drives in. And I want the pretty LEDs that tell me when a drive is bad. So I have a Synology, and it's awesome. It emails you when you're when a drive is going bad. Like it will pre-tell you if the drive is showing signs of going bad. It's great. But the problem with my Synology is it's the lowest RAM module that they sell, and it is slow. If you need to do anything with the web interface, like horrendously slow. Yeah. I really just need something that just takes drives and gives me some redundancy yes. and then gives me a user that I can use for things. That's really all I want. And that's been a pain to set up with freelance without learning the, learning the entirety of the tool, which yes. is, which is kind of what, you know, ties into our topic, which is, you know, learning, learning the tools, learning the tool. <laughs> what made me think of it was, uh, we've been, at the space, when we first got this G Suite, Google G Suite for non- nonprofits, uh, all of our makerspace file storage stuff has been done on um, 
personal shared folders from other people's, uh, you know, Google accounts. And so it's just a tangled web of shared folders. Yes. And it's always been kind of a nightmare because someone might may own a file and you want to do something to it and won't let you do it. Um, and I wanted, I wanted a central place where everything can be done and managed by the officers because it just, it's just kind of a headache. And also I want to use more cloud storage at the space, but I, I guess I thought we only had 30 gigs per account and uh, we couldn't find any ways to increase the storage. And I was like, well, let's look at op- other options. So I was looking at OneDrive. I was looking at, you know, self-hosted things, maybe, you know, a, n- another next cloud thing in the in, in a virtual machine. But then I started actually digging into what G Suite for nonprofits is. And it's a weird subset of, of Google G Suite. It's technically, you know, G Suite business or basic. Okay. But then they take a couple things out. They give you 30 gigs, you know, per user account, and then you get the domain account. But then you also, they throw in Google Classroom, which, it, which uh, I don't know if that's in the normal G Suite or not. I've never heard of it before. Yeah. It, it's mostly used in G Suite education. Okay. So there, there's an actual tier of G Suite education, okay. teachers and schools. So that's thrown in there. They took out one of the fun things I wanted. But then, you know, I didn't know that until I actually started digging into it. And then I saw that they allow shared drives. And that's in air quotes. It's called a shared drive. That's like the technical term. It's not a generic drive that is shared. Okay. But what it is, it's a centralized drive for your entire organization, which is the River City Labs domain, which all of us are now a part of. So now we can have a, so that gives us a centralized location to store files. If you set the permissions up right. It can be automatically added, you know, when you get new members. But the but that's essentially what our original. It's what it's what we meant to implement with the original sharing of the folders. Okay. But proper. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, we had no idea it existed because no one took the time to look into what G Suite for nonprofits is and and like what what is the full capability of it. Okay. So. So this past week, I've been spending a lot of time getting all of our existing stuff from the public folders copied over, and that's been a huge headache because for some reason, Google Drive takes a billion years to zip anything up and download it. Oh my God, yes. So that's been a huge pain. Um, yeah, the fastest way to get everything down from Google Drive is download Drive Sync and then just like make a folder and make sure you have a lot of space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's there's no Linux client for that. They said it's coming. That was five years ago. Yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say it's been a lot of years. Yeah, it, and that was the other reason I went to Nextcloud was it had a good Linux client. But you know what, Nextcloud doesn't have a good Google Chrome client for a Chromebook. Mm-hmm. There is, there, it doesn't exist. And like you can even with like DAV, where you know you can sync anything to anything, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for crap. But it also doesn't work... DAV also doesn't work reliably with Windows either. I've never been able to reboot Windows and get it to work twice. So what about you, Joe? Have you ran into instances where you thought you needed something else for a a project, then realized you had a tool that could do it all along and you just didn't realize it? You know, I think a really good instances of that um, are software that's really powerful that are common. Like um, any CAD suite that is professional, it's almost impossible to know everything that it can do. And um, But my favorite example of that is Photoshop. Photoshop can be a drawing software. It can be a photo editing software. It can be a photo organization software. It can be a 3D modeling tool (laughs) or Blender. You can model in Photoshop? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Right? Blender is the same way. You can do all of those things in Blender. And those tools are so big, they're almost impossible to know everything. 
Um, I've been trying to think of good examples where I ran into something, but my problem is I usually try to use a tool for something it's not meant for. <laughs> <laughs> like the time I tried to use Blender for an audio editor. It can do it, <laughs> but it doesn't do it even sort of good. Um, but, you know, that was back in the day when I was trying to op- do open source everything. I remember those days. Those were glory days. It was only like two years ago. Or just a few weeks ago. You know, I still try to stick to the theory. You know, as much as I'm open source where it makes sense, I try to I try to do it where I can. I'm trying to think of good examples, though. But my favorite is when you have a software that you know for sure can't do something. And then you try it anyway, and it just recently got an update where they added that feature. <laughs> and that happens all the time with Fusion. Um, and Lightburn. Man, I can't tell you how many times somebody is like, well, you know, I, I want to bring this image in, and I can't really bring this image in, so I need to do this trace thing, and I'm trying to do it in Inkscape. And we're like, just, just open it up in Lightburn. And I think it's control T to trace <laughs> and it will just trace it for you. And then you can laser it. Lightburn's a really good tool for that. I've used Lightburn for so many other things than just laser. Yes. <laughs> stuff. It's just such a good vector design software. Yes. I usually like, so I, I usually, I love it for the offset feature. Yeah. The offset and the welding. So I usually start in light and Lightburn if I want to do something fancy and then import it to Inkscape to and, finish it out. And like, uh, and the the text welding tool, yeah, is just. <sighs> Jason did a good job. Yep. Hmm. I told you this was going to be a different episode. It was going to be calmer. You're right there. Stuck in the camp again. <laughs> Set yourself on fire. Let's while we're, while we're in a lull, let's scoot closer to the fire. Yes, because it's cold now. Yes. It's much better. I don't know. I think a lot of this topic goes back to one of our first episodes, which was right tool for the job. Yep. You know, not only should you know the tool, but you should spend the time to research what you're trying to actually accomplish and find the right tool. Mm-hmm. And it's totally possible that you already have the right tool and didn't even realize it. Exactly. Yeah, when I brought this up, it, I, 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 I spent some time to, to think about it, you know, because you already did the right tool episode. Yeah. It's very close to it because, yeah, you should be using the right tool, but that requires you knowing what each tool is capable of yes. in order to choose the right one. You know, a really good point, though, and I, I kind of brought this up, but I think it's important to be constantly researching your tools so like, even if you know for sure like you know this tool inside now you've been using this tool for a long time if it's something especially now if it's something that is constantly getting updates it's cloud managed like google drive or like fusion 360 and um you know, it's got a frequent development cycle i think it's really important to a keep up with that development cycle it's features are constantly getting added and bug fixes are constantly getting added. Um, and B keep up with it so that you can know the utilities that are mm-hmm. being added. You know, so you know, you're either not complaining about features that you just didn't know about or didn't have features that you just didn't realize. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's a common thread that I see 
on internet forums or um, you know that you're taking full advantage and functionality of your tools. So how would you figure that out? Well, I, you're going to hate this answer, but for most of the tools that I use really, really frequently, I follow them on social media. Uh, <laughs> Cause that seems to be the way that they get communicated now. Um, but also, you know, being a participant in the forums and the community is really big. You know, this is, that's how you and I stay active in all the communities that we're really consistently involved in, right? Is, you know, we're either talking to them on Twitter or talking to them on the forums that they're setting up. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that that's how you and I got to be part of the Pathio beta was we were just active in the development and in constant communication with the people that were developing it in the ways that were possible. Great. Yep. Um, the, uh, you know, watching blog posts, watching the seminars that come out on the software, that's big. Um, I think anybody that's really active in specific tools kind of does that already. Like, but and that's the biggest way to find out about new features and constantly pushing your limits. That too. Yeah. Yeah. You and I are always pushing our skills to the breaking point, trying to figure out how to deal with things for the makerspace and trying to, figure out things for this podcast and trying to figure out things for our projects. But I I think a lot of people kind of sit back and rest on what they're comfortable with in in their projects Yeah, or, or in their daily work. Like we're really digging into things that are career based now. Like we are and people make careers as CNC operators or as laser operators or as, IT Gra- professionals. Graphic design, IT professionals. Like, we, th- this episode really is digging hard into things that people make careers out of. And, you know, I think it's common where people, they'll just kind of sit back and be like, well, I know this really well. I don't need to know more. And that's, we've been doing case. it the same way for 30 years. We don't need to do it different. Or, my favorite, the robot couldn't see things with that camera 20 years ago and it can't see him today. I feel like you're missing the biggest one, Joe. What's that? You got an RTFM. Oh. You got to read God. the fucking manual. But sometimes it's so painful. <laughs> I love good documentation, though. Good documentation is gold. When somebody like really takes the time to make really good documentation, it's my favorite. And it's something that I'm trying to get better about and better at. And something that I'm actively working on. Since I got the wiki set up at the space, I've found that I really enjoyed... I I don't know if I'd call it documentation strictly, but... Like archi- archiving knowledge. Yes, I have. I really like it so far, and I love. I'm becoming a, a, a wiki nerd at this point. I'm like, can it go in the wiki? Throw it in the wiki. And I'm like, let's format it. Let's get everything nicely, you know, properly looking nice. And the makerspace scribe. Yeah. I, I, I was, Archivist. Yeah, I was talking the other week that if I ever step down um, from presidency, I'm probably going to go go for our, like our secretary role and we have a, there's a small rule in our bylaws that whenever you take a new off, take a, a new office you can rename that position to whatever you want <laughs> so i'm gonna take the secretary position and i'm gonna rename it the uh the grand magus or something like that grand maester grand Ma- yeah the grand maester and then make it more of like an archivist type role where I'm, I'm more documenting the happenings of the space the history of it how things work Really, I just want to work. I just want an excuse to work on the wiki full time with the space and have to deal with all this administration bullshit. Strongly support this, <laughs> especially the name. Yeah. But it's it's important, and you know this is, you know this is why NAM was developed 
and this is why before nom was developed i was working on starting a project similar to nom and i'm glad that somebody else did it because they did it way better than i would have um nation of makers if you if you don't catch the nom acronym um but you know there's a lot to be learned from the past and i think that's one good thing about our makerspace and how we're we're doing things is there's the old officers are still around to be consulted when new decisions are being made yeah and you know you guys in your term have come up with a lot of things that we have done in the past that failed (laughs) and i can't think of anything off the top of my head but and there are definitely discussions where it's like oh yeah we did that this one time and it didn't go well (laughs) it's been very valuable having the old officers around because i have whenever i have like a weird new idea i usually run it by them first before i bring it up to the actual officers just just to make sure it's not stupid yeah or like it didn't fall on its face before and it's been super valuable. But at some point, you know, they're not going to be here. It'd be nice to have that written down somewhere. Yes. The Grand Meister. <laughs> yeah, I'm at, yeah, I'm going to be like like the, the, the Meister from Game of Thrones. I'm going to have like the big white beard and just like... We'll make you big chains. Yeah, I get giant chains. And I just, I just, I just slowly putz around the, the maker space, like shaking my finger at things. That should be in the wiki. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. I have things to say. Um Yeah. How is Git Books working for you as a on your side of the wiki? I haven't added anything since we've done the Git Books change. Oh, it's great. Is it's it? so nice. Um the the what so what we had before was um, based on CNCJS, but that required you to actually write actual markdown. It was, it was based on CNCJS. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's, it's 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 WikiJS. It's whatever the thing is JS. It's uh, WikiJS. That was a that was Aaron trying to jab me. He was like CNCJS is so good. It even handles our wiki. <laughs> <laughs> it was it is a uh, WikiJS. And it was nice, but required you to write actual markdown, which is a bit of a turnoff for the non, you know, text file-y people. Yeah. Uh, whereas Gitbook, it's still behind the scenes. It's still based on Git and Git source control. And it actually can back up to a GitHub repo, which is what we have currently. And it it's really neat. It works both ways. If you really wanted to, you could go into the GitHub repo, change the markdown files yourself, and it will sync it to the oh. to the web version or just do it in the web version like a normal person and then it will sync it to the github repo so it's it's still backed up okay but they have a really nice web ui where you know you just log in go to the page you want there's a, a cute little you know edit button in the bottom you click on that then uh, you can just you know type into the page itself just like any word document but they give you so many options like you can add like all, all the center markdown stuff which is like super fancy like you know, short codes, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. There's just a click. You like, here's a bulleted list. You can add mathematical notations. You can, you know, do all the stuff. What I did find out, which is not intuitive, but it's possible is when you, you can embed the YouTube videos and you can embed like anything with a URL or, or um, code like that. You paste it in there and then you hit enter. When you hit enter, then it figures out it needs to embed it. Ah. It doesn't say that anywhere. I found a random blog post where it said that that's possible. <laughs> But whoever wrote that was like, they're just, they'll just hit enter after they paste this, right? But it's been amazing. Like, Alan and Fred are, have been adding a bunch to it. Alan's done a ton to the wiki. Nice. Know? And, and that, I think that alone is, is, you know, testament to how easy it is. But it's been going really well. I think just anybody who has tried to edit something has been able to edit something, which is, which was the goal. Yeah. I have a permanent, uh, a permanent edit privilege invite link in, okay. in our in the ch- in the channel description of our wiki channel in Slack. So anybody who's interested can just go to the wiki channel, you know, get the, get an invite to the to the to the project, and they can just edit whatever they want. Um, I also made a whole wiki page on how to contribute to the wiki, um, just some basic you know formatting guidelines. But if, and, and I, I made sure to make it clear that if you don't know how to format things, don't worry about it. The important thing is the content. Yeah. Somebody else can come back later and format things. But Gitbook's been really nice. 
And you bring up Slack. Slack is another tool where there's so much hidden functionality and like things that you just wouldn't know. Yeah. Um, like uh, private channels. Like we had that discussion the other oh, yeah. day. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been using our Makerspace Slack as my private project notebook for years now. And then Aaron went through and found all the channels where I didn't make them private. I left them public because I felt like other people could use them. And he was like, I hate this channel. I hate this channel. I hate this channel. Take them all away. Um, But no, like uh, Slack is a fantastic tool for project management. Um, And if you're part of one and you have creation privileges, you can make your own private channels and then track whatever you want and build reminders into it and do all this cool stuff. I use remind me a lot. Oh my gosh. Yes. I even have it remind other people. Yes. Uh, Alan wanted me to remind him to bring something to the space. I'm like, I'm not going to remember that. (laughs) So I'm like, remind Alan. Yes. At this time to bring the thing. (laughs) I used to use that for Tim all the time. And yeah, it's so good. So good. I've been really digging into the Slack API this past week for this automation thing. And it's pretty good, but there's, there's, I'm starting to, you know, hit the boundaries of what's, what's possible with it. And, uh, there's actually a whole opens, there's actually a whole like project in GitHub on the undocumented Slack API (laughs) where there, there are endpoints out there that Slack won't officially support, but they're there and they work. One of which is actually inviting people to Slack. Really? There, there's no official endpoint to invite people programmatically to the workspace. Okay. And so all the research I've done, everybody uses this un- undocumented API. And the problem that they want to support it is that it uses the legacy Slack token, which is tied to a user instead of a tied to like a bot or an app. They, the app slash bots in Slack, they use their own new token, which is much more secure. Okay. Better to handle but the old API uses the old um, legacy tokens. So I had to create a brand new account just under the River City Labs like account, like email. So like rivercitylab at gmail.com. I threw it, I made an account for that, made, made it an admin of the workspace, and then made it a token for that. So now now at least the token in the account is controlled by the, uh, the current officers. Okay. Um, instead of tying it to my own account, if I were to ever leave, then that would, it would break the functionality. Right. But like, that's not a secure. So I've been, I've been me, I've been meaning to bug Ryan about, Hey, this is a very insecure <laughs> method. You guys should really, you know, re-implement this with the new thing. So I don't have to dick with the undocumented stuff. Yeah. He'll probably tell you he doesn't care. <laughs> I was like, Oh, sweet. Slack has a Python, you know, SDK for the API. It's like, yeah, I wrote it. <laughs> All right. He hasn't done, he, he's ignored every one of my questions. I don't blame him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he hasn't ignored them. He read them and laughed and then went about his day. <laughs> oh, well, I think we've been, how long have we been recording for? I have no idea how to turn the, the light on on this thing. Oh, no, I'm going to spill. Uh, oh yeah so we're well into an episode length nice and um i kind of want to just watch the fire (laughs) so last call last call read the fucking manual yeah yeah and watch the blog post and make friends with people on the internet always make friends with people Ask good questions in forms. Yes. Do your research, formulate the question, then ask it. Yeah. Yeah. Ask search good, functions key. Ask good questions. Don't ask the question that's been asked so many times. Here's my, my, my tip for fusion questions. Don't ever ask if fusion is still free. <laughs> Cause it is just poke around a little bit. Okay. It's still free. I promise. All right. With that, keep making stuff. This is the end of the podcast. That's pretty decent. Pretty decent. Pretty decent. Pretty decent.
Pretty decent. Pretty decent.